Let's go to Ed O'Keefe in the spin room with Senator Elizabeth Warren. Ed. Elaine, thank you. We're joined by Senator Warren. Uh, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Let, let me ask you this. You, you, you clearly uh, provoked one of the more spirited moments of the night. Uh, why did you feel the need to call out that difference between yourself and Mayor Buttigieg when it comes to fundraising especially, but also just sort of your general theory of how a campaign should be run? Why do that? Look, yesterday the President of the United States was impeached. And the basic issue is corruption. It's about how he has enriched himself, how he's enriched others, how he's sold ambassadorships. Democrats are going to win when we draw the sharpest distinction between Donald Trump and his corruption that is helping the wealthy and the well-connected and that we are going to be on the side of the American people. And how do you credibly draw that distinction? Well, for me, it's partly about what you show by the kind of campaign you run. Uh, you know, I decided not to do a business-as-usual campaign. Uh, I decided I was going to start this campaign by doing selfies and going to town halls. I've been to 29 states and Puerto Rico, and that's given me a chance to shake hands and get hugs and hear a lot of stories from folks. Other people on that stage have decided that they'll run their campaign by hanging out with wealthy donors who can pay $5,000 and upward in order to take a photograph to have a conversation and maybe to be the one who'll be picked to be ambassador. And I get it. In a democracy, everybody has a point of view, everybody gets a vote. But the people who have a lot of money to spend should not be able to drown out the voices of everyone else. And uh, in my campaign, they don't. And in my administration, they won't. Tactically, though, you did you feel the need to do this because he's climbing at a time when your numbers have either sort of stagnated or aren't climbing the way they were just a few months ago? No, this is about the kind of campaigns we're running. Uh, you know, I've called uh, from the very beginning on everyone to fund your campaigns through grassroots. I've said that I don't think billionaires ought to be reaching into their own pockets and buying elections. And I don't think any other Democrat should be making it by sucking up to billionaires. If we want to win this election, we better draw a sharp line between who Donald Trump is, the guy who works for the billionaires and the giant corporations, and who we are, and show people that that's what's really going to matter in their lives. I'm willing to get out there and fight so we can cancel student loan debt, so we can make sure that universal preschool and child care is available, so we can put money into our public schools. Those are things we can do that touch people's lives, but not if we're working for the billionaires. If a millionaire or a billionaire out there actually wanted to max out to your campaign and donate the $2,800, you okay with them doing that? Sure. I, I don't sell access to my time. I did call time recently. And I called a couple of people who had donated five bucks. I called somebody who donated 20 bucks. And this is the moment where I should say, and anybody who wants me to give me, uh, uh, wants me to give them a call, should go to elizabethwarren.com and pitch in five bucks. Because that's how we should be building a grassroots campaign. You don't get to have the special conversation with me behind closed doors just because you're rich. You don't get to have that uh, I'd like to be an ambassador because you've promised to gather up a quarter of a million dollars from a bunch of your wealthy buddies. That's a broken democracy. We need a democracy that's built on everybody has a voice, everybody's part of it. We build a grassroots movement. And here's the thing. We do that. That's how we win. I don't want to belabor this too much, but in this hall tonight, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, mm -hmm. pointed out that that wine cellar that you referenced is a place where many progressive Democrats have gone to hold events like the one Mayor Buttigieg held, uh, but other events as well. And he sort of dismissed it and said, look, you're disparaging California Democrats who have held events at this location. I'm just curious what you would say in response. You know, look, um, it is the case that the mayor said a couple of weeks ago that he was not going to do any closed door fundraisers. And then he ends up in a wine cave filled with crystals where they're drinking $900 bottles of wine. And at that dinner, uh, the press is locked down. And here's the thing. The American people 
understand that Washington just keeps working better and better and better for a thinner and thinner slice at the top. We have to make the case credibly that we're not here to work for the billionaires. We're here to work for the people. You know, we decided in this country a long time ago that rich people in smoke-filled rooms were not going to pick our next president. We shouldn't have billionaires in crystal-filled wine caves pick our next president either. Uh, I want to bring our colleague, Caitlin Huey Burns, into this conversation as well. Um, uh, Hi, how are you, Caitlin? Good, good to see you. See you. Um, go ahead, Caitlin. It was a really interesting exchange at the end of the night, the last question, um, and about asking for forgiveness. And only the two women on the stage actually asked for forgiveness and said that they, they would do so. Um, you are the only woman now in the top tier, really, when you look at the polls. Amy Klobuchar also was on stage tonight. But, but what does that mean to you, first of all? And wh why do you think it is that the women on the stage felt the need to seek forgiveness? You know, look, all I can say is I know the kind of race I'm running, and I know the kind of fight I'm fighting. And I realize sometimes I get a little hot when I do it. But it's not because I'm, I'm angry at somebody. It's because I'm angry at a system that's broken, a system that's just not working for millions of people across this country. And so... If I've gotten too hot, I am sorry. And I'm, you know, to me, that's what it takes. You have to be a little self-knowledge about who you are and willing to stand up and own it. But with Kamala Harris's departure and having, you know, just two women on the stage and again, just you really at the top of the polls, um, did, did, has it taken on an extra significance in your campaign, um, being a woman and kind of the historic nature it? Of sure it sure has. I miss Kamala. Uh, and it particularly hit hard that the day that Kamala announced that she had to get out of this race because of money was the same day that a billionaire bought his way onto the stage. You know, our democracy should not be a democracy of billionaires reaching into their pockets to buy elections. It shouldn't be about people having to fly around the country to suck up to billionaires. Because if that's what picking a Democratic nominee is all about, either one of those, then watch out, because the world's about to get a whole lot better for billionaires. Um, we have a chance to have this, this different kind of conversation. Kamala was an important part of that. Kirsten, was it, Kirsten Gillibrand was an important part of that. And so just a couple of weeks ago, um, I lifted up a couple of issues that they have worked on um, and said, not just that I want to pick those issues up, but I want to give them credit that this was Kirsten's work and I'm glad to be part of it. This is about paid family leave. And this is Kamala's work uh, about pre-approval for states that have been trying to undercut Roe versus Wade before they can pass any new laws. And I want to be part of that, but I want to lift up Kamala's voice in it too. We understand that you're heading home to Oklahoma uh -huh. uh, in a few days. Um, you are a, a, a very progressive senator, uh -huh. uh, presidential candidate. Oklahoma is a very red state, deep yep. red state. What is this homecoming going to be like for you? Well, I'll be there with my three brothers and my nephews and my nieces and everybody else, and I'll be there to speak at the high school that I went to. But understand, it's in the first red state I've gone to. I've been to 29 states. I've been to West Virginia, and I've been to Mississippi, and I've been to Alabama. I've gone to Utah, which is not as red as it used to be. Um, and I've been to the red parts of blue states. Um, because when we talk about corruption. People all across this country get it. When we talk about how we need to make investments, not just in our kids born into privilege, but into all of our kids, people get that. So I had a great event in Kermit, West Virginia. We held it in the firehouse. And Kermit advertised itself as the reddest of the red. But we started out by talking about opioids and talking about how giant corporations were able to get away with, with promoting a crisis that has taken away brothers and sisters and children and moms and dads, and they did it all for profits. And where was our government 
Our government was on the side of the drug manufacturers, not on the side of the people. When I'm president, that stops. I wanted to ask you, you brought up Mayor Bloomberger. He came up in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Earlier today, uh, campaigning in Tennessee, uh, made an interesting argument that, um, actually it wasn't in Tennessee, it was in an interview, suggested that nobody else in the field has as much management experience as he does. Therefore, he's best qualified to be president on day one. Just curious how you would respond to that. You know, look, I think what people want to know is who you're out there fighting for. Uh, is Mike Bloomberg fighting for himself, or we're going to have a president who's going to be fighting for everyone? But do understand this. I set up an entire agency. President Obama, after we got the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau passed, uh, President Obama asked me to come set it up, and I took that from zero to a fully functioning agency. And here's the thing. When you do something like that, um, you actually do some good for a lot of people. Uh, that little agency has now forced the biggest banks in this country to return more than $12 billion directly to people they cheated. You know, we know how to make government work for the people. We just have to have the will to do it. To your point about is he spending his money to his benefit or to other, mm -hmm. for other reasons, he also made the point today that he helped pay for uh, the Democratic Party's ability to retake the House last year by donating to Democratic candidates, to the DCCC, mm -hmm. to voter mobilization efforts. Mm -hmm. You know that he has been a top donor to places like the Sierra Club and Moms Demand Action who are pushing for gun control. So to the charge that he's doing it for himself, he could justifiably turn around and say, I have been donating to various causes that are important to Democrats. Look. He has made a lot of donations, and I'm sure we're all grateful for that. But understand, I'd like him to pay a two-cent wealth tax so that we could provide universal child care for every baby in this country, age zero to five. That same two-cent wealth tax would let us cancel student loan debt for 43 million Americans. That same two-cent wealth tax would let us send every kid who wants an education to technical school, two-year college, or four-year college. That two-cent wealth tax would let us invest $50 billion into historically black colleges and universities. It would let us put $800 billion directly into our public schools. It would let us fully fund IDEA, which means children with disabilities would get the full education they're entitled to. Would let us raise the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher in America. So thank you for your charitable contributions, Mayor Bloomberg. But please, join me on a two-cent wealth tax so we can invest in an entire generation. And, and finally, we're coming out of impeachment. We're going to come out of the holidays here in the next few days. And many Americans who haven't been paying attention to this election are probably going to start paying attention to it. Where does your campaign go in January with the obvious caveat that there might be an impeachment trial? Um, and what is your message to those who may now just be tuning in to this campaign? Um, my message is pretty straightforward. Washington has been working better and better and better for a thinner and thinner slice at the top for decades now. It is the influence of money. We have this amazing chance in 2020 to turn that around and to build a grassroots movement and make this government work, not just for the folks at the top, but make it work for everyone. That's why I'm in this fight, and I think we're going to win it. All right. Well, happy holidays. Thank Thanks you. again for Good stopping by. We appreciate it. And uh, I leave you in the hands of your <laughs> handlers to, to figure out where you're going next. Go ahead, Chris.